Hello and welcome back to Common Ostrich Models. On this week's episode of The Learning Curve, we'll be taking a crack at painting a NATO tricolor camo scheme on this Trumpeter LAV25. As always, we ensure the model is clean, dry, and dust-free before we begin priming. A new trick I've picked up is to test the paint on a piece of cardboard in between each coat. This lets me make sure my airbrush and my paint is good before I put it on the model. It also lets me check that I like the colors I've mixed up and see how they'll look on top of the previous layer. I'm starting with this gloss black primer and then I'm gonna pick out all the highlights with white in the next step. When I'm priming, I like to build it up in two to three light coats. This ensures even coverage and it minimizes pooling. Make sure you keep a firm grip on your parts so you're not dropping them and scuffing up your paint jobs. I attach wheels to toothpicks to make them much easier to handle while I'm painting. And here it is with a few coats of primer, ready for the next step. I'm checking my airbrush on the paint chip, and now I'm ready to start highlighting. We're highlighting the center of doors and armor panels, as well as high spots and small details. The gradient of black to white helps to create variation in the base color, and also helps to create some shadows in recesses and highlights in protrusions. I also highlight flat surfaces and hard edges that would be directly lit from overhead light. This gradient also helps to break up the monotonous surface of large panels, such as these doors. With the highlights done, now we're ready to move on to the base coat. Here you can see the variation that the two previous layers give this solid base coat. Now to get the base coat going. I really need to find a better way to hold things when I'm painting. I try not to spray it on too thick so that that gradient from the previous steps shows through, but I still want to get good, relatively even coverage. I want the color transitions to be smooth. I don't want any standout spots that are too dark or too light. These large, flat areas that would otherwise be a single tone look much more interesting with the variation provided by the gradient. The base coat is now complete. In the next step, we'll work on refining the shadows. I'm using a slightly darker mix of the previous color in order to reinforce the shaded areas. I focus this effect on areas that don't have direct overhead light and areas between high spots. I also use it to emphasize cracks, panel lines, and gaps. Post shading helps to visually separate doors and other small details from the main body of the model. Here you can see all the shading we achieved with only two different mixes of olive drab. We repeat this process in the next step, but this time picking out high spots with a lighter paint mixture. This allows me to clean up some of the overspray from the shadows and also creates more variation in the base color. Then I pick out some small details with an even lighter shade of the base coat in order to make them pop. Small high points like bolts, rivets, grab handles, and sharp corners all get this treatment. This effect looks pretty jarring but it'll be toned down during weathering. Properly thinned paint, nice brushes, and magnifying glasses really make this 
a lot easier than it looks. I accidentally got a drop of rubbing alcohol on the model, but instead of restarting, we'll fix it in the next stage. I make noodles out of blue tack and mask out the first color. I test it on the paint swatch to see how it's going to contrast with the base color. You can see I tried a different mix of brown and I didn't like it. Now that I have the color dialed in, I applied it to the areas that I've masked off. I pay close attention to how my airbrush is spraying and make sure not to get any overspray. I'm using a small piece of cardstock to prevent overspray on certain areas. Once I get the first layer of brown down, I add a drop of buff to the mix and paint the center of the splotches. Then I peel off the masking and pick out the details that have been sprayed over. Even though I have to redo some of these highlights, I prefer doing it this way because I can just lighten up whatever color I used in my airbrush and then brush paint it on. Then I mask off the next color and get to painting. You can see how I fixed that little mistake from earlier. Because the blue tack noodles are cylindrical, you have to make sure to spray at multiple different angles to ensure a hard edge. Then I add a few drops of engine gray and do the center of the splotches. And now to reveal the camouflage. This was my first time doing a three color scheme and I'm really happy about the way it came out. I can definitely work on masking and reducing overspray. And I think next time if I do brown on green, I'll make sure there's a little more contrast. But overall, I'm really happy. Now I just need to pick out all the little details that got covered by the black splotches. If you have any hints, tips, tricks, or techniques, make sure to leave a comment below. And here's the camo scheme completed. There are a couple small areas that I'll need to touch up. I'll use both brush painting and an airbrush to do that. Now I move on to the small details. I really like doing these Pioneer tools. I think the tan color of the wood really pops against the color of the rest of the model and it makes it look a lot more lively. This was my first time trying wood with this technique. I mixed up a very light tan, relatively thin, and applied it in an uneven layer. Then I used a thin dark brown mix and washed that over the light color. I made sure the application was relatively uneven to represent wood grain. Then I combined those two previous mixes as a mid-tone and went over the whole thing. Compared to how I was doing wood before, I think the results are great for how easy this was. For the metal, I used a mix of gray and black. More details will be added during the weathering phase, but this creates a really good base for scratches and rust effects. Make sure to paint the tools all the way to the edge. Crisp, even lines will help differentiate the tools from the surface of the armor. I went with red for the shovel handle because it provides a really nice pop of contrast against that green background. 
When brush painting, I make sure to properly thin my paints. Thick paint will leave brush strokes and look chunky. Thin paint needs to be layered, but leaves a much more consistent surface. Tamiya paints, I usually mix one to one with thinner. For Vallejo Air, it's somewhere around two or three to one. I think these are by far the best Pioneer tools I've done yet. For the headlights, I originally went with a very bright off-white color. I went back and ended up repainting these with a more yellowed tone. The marker lights were done in thin layers as well to slowly build up the color. Multiple layers of thinned paint really help to show depth and detail. Now I paint the caps of the smoke projectors and the jerry cans. I made sure to use a different green than the rest of the model. I want these straps to create visual interest and to contrast with the jerry can, so I use a lighter shade of OD to stand out. And now, with all the detail work done, we're ready for the final reveal. And with that, we have a painted Lab 25, ready for weathering. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for next week's episode where I'll be finishing this model. If you enjoyed this video and want to stay updated, make sure to like and subscribe. To see more pictures and videos of this project and others, check out my Instagram. The link's in the description. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of The Learning Curve.